So in this video, we're going to look at a simple state machine that has both an input and a simple output. So the state machine in question is a sequence detector. So I'll give you some background on how that works. And uh, basically, I have two devices that are connecting to each other, maybe, maybe wirelessly or over a serial cable. And the idea is that they're just transmitting one bit at a time serially. So let's say the direction of transmission is this way. So A is transmitting to B. And um, somehow they need to sync up. Um, a is, gonna, is about to send a transmission to B and needs to notify B that a transmission is about to occur. So the way it might do that is to send a sequence, a predefined or preset sequence of bits that indicates to be, be on the lookout because as soon as this sequence is over, a transmission is about to begin, like some data is about to, to be received. Um, and so I have a single input in my state machine which is just basically a bit. At every clock cycle, B will receive a bit over the air, and it is going to sample that bit to see if um, over a series of several cycles, um, it, 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 there's a sequence of a predefined sequence of bits. So there's a single bit input X, and a single bit output Y that is high when, for one clock cycle, when the sequence is detected, and is low otherwise. So we're just gonna make this up. So basically, uh, we're gonna say that, um, the sequence we want to detect, so the bit sequence is, um, let's do one, one, zero, zero. Let's just do it like that. So what does that mean? It means that if over four successive clock cycles, I detect first, at the first clock cycle, I detect a high, incoming high over on, uh, over on the airways over at B. Again, so this sequence detector is implemented here at B. So if at the first clock cycle, I detect a high. Second clock cycle, I detect another high. Third clock cycle, I detect a zero. And fourth clock cycle, I detect a zero. I can be sure that what's coming next is a data transmission. So B is gonna, the sequence detector at B is gonna output a high. That's gonna go to whatever, um, data uh, receiver circuit uh, that is going to, to be responsible for decoding the data. So, um, so essentially what it looks like, I'm gonna draw, so of course I'm always gonna follow my usual steps. I'm gonna follow my state transition diagram. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write all the possible states that I have. So the original state that I have is the idle state. And I'm gonna use that same convention where I'm gonna draw a line and at the bottom, I'm gonna put my output, which is zero. So again, they are all my outputs are gonna be zero unless I'm in this case where the sequence I'm looking for has been detected over the previous four clock cycles. So my first state is gonna be idle. My second state is gonna be a single high bit has been detected. And again, for that one, I'm gonna also output a zero. My third, my third state is gonna be that a two successive ones have been detected. So basically, I am two clock cycles into detecting my sequence. And again, I'm also going to output a zero here. Why? Because I only output a high in one particular case, which is um, when uh, all the four bits have been detected in successive clock cycles. Uh, the third state I'm going to have 
is that a 110 has been detected. Again, I will output a zero. Um, and in my final state, I will have the all four bits have been detected in the four previous clock cycles. And here I will output a high. Okay. And what's going to happen after this? So now I'm going to show the transitions between them. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to start at, uh, idle and, uh, basically in the idle state, um, I'm going to do it like this in the idle state. If I detect a one, I'm going to move to this state. So I'm going to label my transition with X equal to one. If I'm in the one state and I detect a second one at the next clock cycle, because remember all these transitions occur only at the clock edge, then I will move on to the state that tells me that two successive ones have been detected in, in basically two successive clock cycles. If I'm here and I detect a zero, I move on to the next state. If I'm at, if I've detected a one, one, zero and I detect another zero, then all four bits have been detected. I move on to this uh, final state where my sequence has been detected. I output a one. And what happens from here is that the next clock cycle, I transition back to my idle state where I output a zero. So this one is being output only for a single clock cycle. That's it. Okay, so now I have to, to look at all the other states, all the other possible transitions. So if I'm in the idle state, I know what happens if I detect a one, I transition here. But if I detect a zero, then what's going to happen? Then it just means I'm still, I'm going to remain in the idle state. I haven't begun to detect my sequence yet. So what I'm going to do is draw an arrow here that says, if I detect an X uh, that if I the incoming bit in this clock cycle is low, then I'm just going to stay in the idle state. And it's only when I detect a high that I'll move on to the next state. Okay, so when I'm in this state, a one has already been detected. If I detect another one, then I will move on to this state. But what happens if I detect a zero? Well, that's nothing. Now I've detected my last two clock cycles. I've detected a one and then a zero. Uh, so that, uh, that means that I am not in the midst of uh, detecting my sequence. So I'm going to move back to the idle state. I go back to start, basically. Okay, so I'm at this state now. And I know what happens if I detect a zero. I go here to this state, indicating that in the last three clock cycles, I've detected a one, a one, and then a zero. So what happens if I'm here, though, and I detect another one? Well, that means that in the last three clock cycles, I've detected a one, followed by another one, followed by another one. In other words, in the last two clock cycles, I have detected two high bits in a row. So if I'm in this state and I detect another one, I'm going to remain in that state because this state tells me that I have detected two high bits in the last two clock cycles. So I'm going to remain in this state. Um, now, what happens when I'm in this state? So I have detected a one uh, followed by a one followed by a zero. And if I detect another zero, well, that's easy. I move on here. But what happens if I detect a one? Well, now I've detected. So um, the last four bits that I've detected are one, one, zero, one. Well, I'm really right back here, aren't I? Where I've just detected a one. That might be the beginning of a sequence. So this is my full state transition diagram. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do the excitation table. And to do that, I'm gonna label all my states. So I have five states, which means that I need three bits to represent them. So I'm just gonna arbitrarily, I'm gonna call this state 000. This will be 001. This will be 010. 011, and this will be 100. And 
I'm going to draw my excitation table now. Okay, so what I've done is I started off writing my excitation table. I haven't decided yet what flip-flop to use. My personal preference is to use uh, JK flip-flops. Uh, but what I want you to realize here is that I have sort of four variables. Uh, the next state is dependent on the value of the present state, which is represented by three binary variables, Q2, Q1, Q0, and an input X. I'm going to need 16 rows in my truth table. So I've written out my excitation table like this, where basically uh, these two rows over here represent my idle state. These two rows represent the state where a single high bit has been detected. These two rows represent the state where two high bits in a row over two successive clock cycles have been detected. This represents um, the state where uh, a one followed by one followed by a zero have been detected in the previous three clock cycles. And these two rows represent the case where a one followed by one followed by a zero followed by a zero have been detected in the previous four clock cycles. And the rest are nothing, they're don't care. I'm gonna put them all as don't cares actually, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about after. But essentially now, hopefully the process of filling out my uh, excitation table is pretty straightforward. I'm really just gonna do a straightforward mapping from my state transition diagram to over here, I'm gonna fill out my next state. Essentially, if I'm in state 000, which is this state, a zero has been detected, I stay in that state. If a one has been detected, I move on to 001. So I'm really just using the present state cues to just keep track of what state I'm in here. So they don't have an actual value in and of themselves, they're just keeping track of my states. So I'm gonna translate that here. Now, I'm going to go look at state 001. So in state 001, if a zero has been detected, I go back to zero. If a one has been detected, I go to state 010. Finally, or not finally, but next, in state 010, if a zero is detected, I go to state 011. And if a one has been detected, I stay in the same state. And I'll do the same thing over here in state 011. If a zero is detected, I move on to this state 100. If a one is detected, I move on to state 001. So here's where it really pays off if I've been very diligent about um, my uh about my methodology because now I it's much less confusing. I just have to translate from a state transition diagram to a state table. So uh, if it's one, I go to zero, zero, one. Finally, when I'm in this state indicated by one, zero, zero, I'm just gonna output high for one clock cycle, but at the very next clock cycle, I'm gonna go back to idle. So um, I'm gonna write that here. So regardless of what my input is, at the next state, I go back to idle. I'm assuming that um, I have a data transmission incoming and I'm going to, to activate the circuitry to decode it. And then for everything else, I'm just gonna put a giant X for don't care. That's how this works. So when I've put the X for don't care, what I'm really saying is I don't expect to find myself in an invalid state. So what I would do in this case is I would have some other mechanism not described here where on power on of my circuit, I would ensure that I was in the idle state. And that makes sense. So I should never expect to find myself in an invalid state because I want to have some additional circuitry that ensures that on power on, I am resetting my state to idle and, um, and waiting for an incoming transmission. And once I do that, there should be no possibility of finding myself in an invalid state. So um, the next thing to do is uh, add, I'm going to combine this 
with the JK flip-flop excitation table. And I mean, you can use D if you know how to, if you know how to use T flip-flops, that's fine too. So anything works. So I'll have six of these. And just for a reminder over here, I'm going to have, I'm going to write down the excitation table for a single JK flip-flop. Okay, so I've written down the excitation table for a single JK flip-flop where uh, PS is present state, NS next state, and CI is control inputs. So what I'm going to do, again, I'm going to go flip-flop by flip-flop, right? So I'm looking at Q2. I, look, I have a zero here. I have a zero there. I'm not looking at the input. Again, I'm just looking at my present state and I'm looking at my next state for the flip-flop whose output is Q2. And I know that for this transition to occur, I need JK to be zero and X. And same here. And I'll just continue filling it out. So if I do all that, I find that I end up with this. Um, so this is my excitation table. Now what I'm going to do is derive the Boolean logic expressions. Okay. So I'm going to set up my Boolean logic expressions, uh, derive the Boolean logic expressions for my control logic. So that is all these guys over here. And to do that, I need to realize that actually my control logic is entirely dependent on these four variables. Q2, Q1, Q0, and X. So that's what I'm going to put in my K map. Like this. And I'm going to start off by doing my uh, K map for J2. So let's fill that in. Okay, so this is not yet complete, but uh, I have, I want to show you the, so the bare bones block diagram. I've got my state memory over here with a clock input. Um, out, the outputs of my state memory are my three Q outputs. They also form the inputs to my control logic, right? Remember that the goal of the control logic is to take the three Q inputs, or to take my present state and generate the control logic, I need all six of these, so for all three flip-flops, to get to my next state and do this whole thing over again. Um, okay, but what am I missing? So I'm missing two things. I'm missing my input X 
And I'm missing some output logic, which actually we haven't yet done. So let's do that now. Okay, so now I'm gonna do my output logic truth table. Now what I can see is my output logic, so what I wanna point out to you here is in the way that I've designed this, my output logic is also, is entirely dependent on what state I'm in. So it doesn't have a dependency on my input. My input only affects my transitions between states. But if I know what state I'm in, that is wholly sufficient information for me to determine what my output is. For example, in state 000, I know that my output is zero. In state 001, my output is also zero. State 010, same thing. Over here in state 011, the output will also always be zero. And it's only here in state 100 that my output is high. So, um, when I go to write my output logic truth table in the way I've designed it here, and I want to tell you that this is not going to always be the case, but the way we've designed it here, I can see that my output is dependent only on the value of my present state. So let's write that. Okay, so we know that in states 0, 1, 2, and 3, my output is always zero, and it's only in state four that is here. So again, I refer to my, if I've designed my state transition diagram correctly, then I can use that very easily to generate my excitation table and also my output logic truth table. So I can see in state zero, zero, all the way through zero, one, one, my output is zero. It's only in state one, zero, zero that my output is high. That's here. And in the others, I'm going to put don't care. So actually, maybe that will uh, make my life a lot easier. So when I do a K map, I will find that actually Y is equal to Q2. So it's only when Q2 is high that the output is going to be high. So that's my output. This is my whole output logic. You will, in some cases, have more complex output logic. Um, and I also could have easily said, if I wanted to really be a stickler about it, I could have said y is equal to, basically, it should only be high in state 100, which is q2, q1 bar, q0 bar. But I'm going to take advantage of all these don't cares to generate a much simpler um, expression, which is basically y is equal to q2. So, um, I'm going to go back here and I'm going to draw my output logic. Now, I know that my in this case, my output logic is so simple. It's literally just a wire from Q2 to the output. But I'm going to put the block in there anyway. I'm going to output my Y. And this is a block diagram. And furthermore, I'm going to tell you that this is... So we know that this is a state machine, meaning that it's a system that cycles deterministically between a finite set of states um, given uh, a certain set of inputs and the present states. So um, that's what a finite state machine is. And um, I'm gonna make a distinction. I'm gonna say that this is the block diagram for a more state machine. I have not introduced you to any other kind of state machine. So you do not know how this differs from another kind of state machine. We'll get to that later, but for now, just I'm just gonna introduce the terminology. So this is what's known as a Moore state machine. Okay, you'll take my word from it, and when we uh, talk about Mealy state machines, you'll see what the distinction is. It's actually quite a simple one. So um, that's pretty much it.